So, without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand the mic over to Mr. Jonathan Sims himself, who is doing this week's opening monologue, My Event Horizon Fever Dream, by me. My Event Horizon Fever Dream, by Alistair Stewart. It takes a certain type of moxie to successfully land a haunted house that's a spaceship as a concept. It takes even more to attract a cast including Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill, Jolie Richardson, Joan Allen, Jack Noseworthy, King of Names, Jason Isaacs, and Sean Hertwig. Making it an actual, legitimately good movie that uses the orbital's Satan as its final jump scare takes the sort of moxie that makes George Clooney nod appreciatively down the bar of the casino at you, even as Sandra Bullock and Kate Blanchett are taking your contact details for their next job. Event Horizon, written and directed by Paul Anderson, has that moxie. The Lewis and Clark is a deep-range search and rescue vessel. Someone drops the ball, they get the call, off at a gallop to save some lives. But the Event Horizon, a test bed for the world's first interstellar drive, has just reappeared after a decade away, and Dr. Weir, the ship's designer, wants answers. Spoiler! All those answers involve horrible things! I love Event Horizon. It's a big, gore-soaked puppy of a movie that folds my favourite horror tropes, hi, I'll be your villain this evening, and I've translated the Latin and it says we're fucked, and throws them into my favourite setting. Plus, it does so with no subtle at all. The Event Horizon's interior looks like a cathedral had blackout sex with an Iron Maiden album cover. The drive itself looks like Pinhead's stress toy. This is clearly the bad place. <laughs> Which makes watching this likeable crew of assholes be slowly but surely destroyed by it, both all the more horrifying <coughs> and all the more entertaining. Now, word comes to us that Event Horizon is about to be adapted for TV by Amazon under the control of Adam Wingard. Wingard is the horror director with a grounded but unflinching eye, and his The Guest is one of my all-time favourite movies. Seriously, it is built like nothing on earth and so much fun. He's doing the work for Amazon, because eventually we all will, and that's not good. But hey, at least this way it won't get cancelled two to three seasons in for featuring women, gay people, and non-Caucasians, right? Netflix. But here's the thing. I want, very badly, this to be one of those shows people don't see coming. And with the benefit of an unlimited budget and not having a job, here's not having the job. So here's how I do it. Lie for two seasons. Have two full seasons of the Lewis and Clark going on adventures, space adventures, space rescue adventures. Have Miller defy orders to drop them into a Martian dust storm and rescue a crew trapped on a satellite. Have Stark be offered the big chair on the, on the fines and turn it down because she realizes she likes being on the Clark more. Follow Coop as the ship rescue technician finds himself working a job in the lunar habitat he grew up in. Show us the horrific trauma that led to DJ becoming the mumbling, quiet, reserved and furious man he is. Have the Clark be the only ship available to rescue Smitty's old posting, including the commanding officer that he transferred to SNR to escape. Full space casualty. Maximum sky truck. You know it makes sense. And it does. Throw a top-notch cast in there. I'm seeing Aldous Hodge as Miller, Lauren Cohen as Stark, Tony Kebbell as Smitty for a start, and let them work and let the audience invest in the show's fundamentally reassuring aesthetic and hard world. The simple, brutal, and fun drudgery of working s &R in a busy solar system. Make us care about these characters. Show us how they became who they are. And then, send them to hell. Play the movie out exactly as it was on screen, Pick them off one by one and make sure it all hurts. Have evil not only assault the sanity of Dr. Weir, but the very shape of the show itself. Curdle space casualty into space casualties. End the show, break the toys, drop the mic and cue the music. Or at least that's what I'd do. Event Horizon is in development at Amazon now, and you can bet I'm looking forward to what they do. I'm just going to have you read everything I write from now on, because that sounded great. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Johnny, how are you? Hello, I'm I'm very well. I'm very well. Very excited to talk about Event Horizon, uh, which I, I assume is, is why I was brought on because, <laughs> I, like, as soon as I read this, I was like, ah, oh, I fucking love that movie. It's so good. It's so good. It's it's Jack it's, a, it's a weird one because like, it, it's so, it's like it's clearly quite rushed and like apparently the actual production was really rushed, but like it it there's so much division I've seen between like. The people who love it tend to be the the people who like kind of see where it's playing and like the fact that like this is a re it's a really hard sort of horror to land and it and it does it really well. Um 
and it's just nice to see people being competent in a horror movie. I think that's that's actually the core of why I love it. That these are all highly trained professionals who are completely unflappable, who just get completely flapped, get flapped to death yeah. in a like, wide variety of ways. Lawrence Fishburne, Lawrence Fishburne makes the call. We're getting out of here at the exact correct moment. Like up until then, it's like ooh, bit ominous, but fundamentally nothing untoward. Not an excuse to scrub the mission. As soon as he's like, uh huh, I see what happened. We're leaving now. And like it's too late. That's that's not like he he made the right call. It's just you know, absolutely it happened to be too late. He, he literally mashes the screw this white nonsense button, and and mm -hmm. it, it, it does nothing. And it's so good. I, I just I'm I'm very very fond of it. Uh, if nothing else, for that final jump scare, because I am incredibly susceptible to a good jump scare. I'm even more susceptible to a really bad one. Uh, and Event Horizon actually has both. The moment where uh, the, oh, high, yeah. the highly trained rescue technician is terrified by a glove in zero G on his shoulder. Or you just like... Uh, yeah, that's... Yeah. What? Uh, and that followed by just Satan crashing into that final scene. It's just... It, it is... It is... Like and, and it's, it's like it, it's also it, like it has a few unearned jump scares I'd say, but it's got plenty of earned ones as well. Uh, and like I, I I always feel that like I don't want to dismiss the jump scare as because like it is it is a it, if it lands, it's good. Mm. But like you got to earn it, and I Absolutely. think I think the movie does. Also, also, apparently, apparently, so you know the um, you know the like the flashes like the single frames of like ah. Oh, over hell suffering. I have an arm in my mouth, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, they shot like a full two minutes, like an edited a full two minute, like grotesque blood death sex orgy, uh, and <laughs> that cut exists on like a single VHS in like some technician, some like film technician's house who doesn't have a VHS player. I it must be. I, I sense a heist, Johnny. I really do. How do we get yeah, our hands well, on that? <laughs> Even if it's I'm, just... I'm obviously not game on a recorded medium, but... Uh, no, of course. But, you know, we'll talk. Possibly in, po it's on the stream. Possibly in a park by a lake feeding ducks. Lawyer says do not discuss on stream. Exactly. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, so you wrote a really good book. Oh, thank you. Yes. Tell I, us, tell I tried. Us, you succeeded. Tell us a little about your book. Um, so, thirteen stories is uh, it is a sort of. Um, I think the 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 word that most of reviews have used is a portmanteau uh, novel, but it's sort of halfway between anthology and full novel. Um, it is set in Banyan Court, uh, a luxury high rise uh, in the heart of Whitechapel, uh, which is. Um, I don't know if you're aware of uh, certain boroughs in London have uh, a rule that if you are building a com luxury accommodation, you have to set a certain portion aside as affordable housing. Uh, but what that almost always means is because there aren't actually the um, additional regulations to like back up what that means, thank you, Tory government, uh, the affordable housing tends to be like very cut corners, um, very like much lower uh, mm. quality building materials, all this sort of stuff. So uh, 13 Stories is uh, the idea of this sort of very, uh, kind of the the epitome of this, this sort of uh, very divided. You've got the front half, which is shiny and new and has a health suite for all the executives and, uh, you know, digital startup uh, CEOs who um, who live there. And the back half is sort of run down and uses a lot more of the old, like the original old bricks uh, from the, the tenement that it grew out of. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the top is Tobias Fell, uh, sinister and, spoiler alert, dead uh, billionaire. Uh, and he dies before, like, he dies at a dinner party attended by 12 other people. And each story, each chapter even, is their story. So each one is a sort of small, largely self-contained um, little ghost story that culminates in this uh, just grotesque climax of uh, dinner party time. death. Fantastic. Um, and, yeah, it's, it was, it's, it was a, a weird one to write because it was, like... 
it's very it's my first novel uh but at the same time it held just just close enough to like the sort of short story roots of something like magnus uh so the magnus archives uh the podcast um that it, it felt like uh it, it was quite it was quite comfortable actually like almost a lot more comfortable than than i, I expected because it, it felt like a, a natural stepping stone if that makes sense mm, it does that's that's actually something that really struck me reading it that it this feels like you trying new things with some tools which are familiar to you and using them in new ways which was was really cool and worked really nicely yeah it was actually um i, I can't take uh, full credit for like the the original seed uh, from which the, the the book grew or indeed the title um because uh my editor at glance rachel um uh, we've been discussing various book projects um and she said oh we've got we've got one that we we like you know i'd very much like to to get written uh and she sort of uh laid out in very broad strokes the idea of like uh haunted haunted tower block um and uh the 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 title of 13 stories and she was like oh but you know obviously if you can come up with a better title that's that's fine i'm like i cannot come <laughs> up with a better title that is a fantastic title um and she was like yeah no we're looking at uh, sort of individual stories that kind of knit together for a single climax uh, ideally with an audio focus do, do you think that's you know do you think that's in your wheelhouse and i was like yeah no, hmm, I can, let me well, think about that I can probably I, I can probably pull that one out I'll try. Uh, I'll see how well it goes. Yeah. Know. So, yeah. So, to a certain degree, like I, I feel a bit bad because it, it does, it does feel like being sort of handed a and said, "Hey, hey, do you want to write a novel on easy mode?" Uh, oh, there's no such thing. But, Don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like as I've rapidly discovered, uh, that that's that's not actually a that's not a thing. That's. <laughs> um. But yeah. Fantastic. So um. A couple of things really leapt out on me as I was as I was reading it, and I wanted to chat to you about them. And also, we have some really good questions mm. from from the audience already. Um, I think my my big thing was, what did you find? This is a slightly loaded question because obviously Magnus is sure. very long form. What did you find fun about working long form in novel? Was there something? Did it enable um, you to do things you haven't done before? Yeah, no, like I, I felt that it was interesting because I, um, I had the space to dive a bit deeper without things needing to be grander, it, grand, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like with Magnus, with sort of very long form stuff, I, I feel like I can get really deep on certain themes, but those that depth, that sort of uh, exploration needs to take place over the course of like several seasons like building on it sort of a bit of an episode by a bit of an episode whereas in this case i felt like i had much more of a space to go go as deep as i wanted right off the bat uh there wasn't a need to be weaving this grand uh grand mystery it was it was much more self-contained which i felt i i, I felt actually it gives you kind of a lot more freedom in a lot of ways, especially, uh, and I, I mean, I tell you that the thing that m the biggest difference is uh, I could go back, like if I had a thought in chapter 12, I could go back to chapter one and uh, just completely redo it, uh, which in an ongoing podcast, if in episode like 153, you're like, oh, that would have been a really good idea. Can I get, oh, no, no, because episode 18 on the wiki. And that would contradict <laughs> it very directly. I, I and sometimes, sometimes you do it anyway. But you know, uh, it's, it's, okay. it's no one's listening. being able to work with the text as a whole uh, is is a is a very different experience. Yeah, I, I, I hadn't thought of that actually. The fact that stuff that occurs to you as time goes on um, ends up influencing how the novel opens and so on. That's really cool. Yeah, and it's. It's one of those things where, like, with the, the podcast, so much of the early stuff, you have to leave things open. You have to leave hooks, like, so that you... Because you know that later on you're going to need to be tying things together, but you're not 100% sure of the shape of things in the future. So, like, mm -hmm. you've got to be at least a little bit non-committal uh, in the early stages of something really long form 
Uh, whereas with this, yeah, because it because you ultimately you have a whole you can work on as a as an entire text. Uh, you can be a lot more. You you can get into it right from the start. The other thing which which kind of really jumped out at me is it feels very London. And and it feels feels very London in kind of both a locational way and a very kind of socio political way. And you, the the point that you open with about how you know these tower blocks have to have affordable housing and also have the yuppie hives in them. I'm I'm really curious. I'm really curious as to what kind of research you you came across as you were digging into that, uh, and whether there was anything that didn't make it in. Um. Yes, and no, like a lot of, I mean, I feel like a lot of the London stuff comes from, I mean, just having lived in London for like better part of a decade now, um, and like most of the, like, I feel like most of the kind of emotional palette uh, I use to to talk about London is very much like coming from coming from me and my own experiences and my own sort of relationship to this huge weird distended mess of a city <laughs> um but uh like i i i i mean i love history research i i love like looking into just picking a thing and kind of diving down uh into it um and it was i i think like most of the research that i did was um on whitechapel itself uh um because that's the that's the the area I wanted it set because I wanted it to to be in I wanted it to be in central London but to still have that um uh, still have that specific sort of gentrifying socio-political um place I get you um uh, and uh, the like I was, I was about to say that there's uh that there, there's all sorts of uh like, the, the amount there is a chapter where uh, one of the the characters has some difficulty researching the history of Whitechapel without just constantly stumbling across uh, just gratuitous shit about Jack the Ripper. Uh, and that, <laughs> that, that, that's that's very that that is that is uh, very much drawn from life because um, yeah it, it it is it is an area whose history is dominated by just one fucking dickhead. Uh, and it's like, could just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I can't, I can't offhand think of like. I'm, I love research, but I'm so bad at like keeping it in my head. I like, I'll dive super deep down a rabbit hole, and I'll be like, oh, that's a fantastic fact. That one's going in, and it'll be like, what else did you did you read in the last four hours? I have, I have, I have this fact. It's a fact. It's <laughs> shiny. Uh, so I, I, I can't offhand think of like uh, a lot of specific like London information, but yeah, so so much of it is just you, you, you live, you live, and you rent specifically in London for uh, for a decade, and there's a, a also like i uh, weirdly working night shift for like uh, a couple of years right when i first moved up here is it, it shows you such a completely different side of a city uh to like see it constantly at night um just sort of all the different because there's so much of the city that you don't normally see during the day and i don't specifically mean like all the the nightlife or the dark side i mean like the, the market stall folks who are out yeah. at like three in the morning uh, setting up or, or like, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, cause we, we used to work uh, seven days on seven days off. And uh, so on six o'clock on a Monday morning, we go down the only pub that was open at 6am because it catered to the um, catered to these markets. Uh, and you just watch people sort of trundling into work and it's, it's yeah. I, I sorry. I, I've lost my train of thought just, but uh yeah it's okay. uh, there's there, there's a lot of there's a lot of london and you know a lot of me in the book i think that's that 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 very much comes across and it's it feels unique it feels very distinct in kind of tone and approach and i'm because i'm an enormous structural nerd i'm incredibly curious about how well mapped out this was because the way that you lay out 
characters who are glimpsed in the background early on and then become central later and how consequences echo around one another. How much of that was organic and how much of that was intricate plotting? Well, uh, so um, well, it was all three to different degrees. So uh, I, I'm very much a structuralist. So like to start with, I went through and like plotted out who I saw as like the linchpin characters who were constantly getting up in other people's uh, stories um, and like which characters had like a bit of overlap, which were the like important characters who didn't have their own chapters but would be cropping up in other ones. And like I, somewhere on a on a hard drive somewhere, there's still like the actual text document of the, that original like sort of. Uh, web i guess of um connections um then i sort of talked it through with uh, rachel who was coming at it much more from a <coughs> um how we wanted each chapter to feel like the idea that each chapter has a has echoes of a slightly different sort of horror story like mm -hmm. um the the tech ceo uh we wanted to have a, a sort of a, a kind of a black mirror vibe um that we uh, there's one that we wanted to sort of go into like kind of conspiracy theory horror um some that like um have a much more of a uh, Tech uh like an old school cursed object sort of vibe yeah. um and so like uh and so uh we discussed that and like that that became a sort of a different sort of um uh like structure that we sort of ended up marrying the two uh, and then over the course of editing, a lot of that sort of would get changed because, uh, you know, you, uh, I'd, I'd get notes back saying like, okay, this, this is good, but we need more, we need more Damien. Like Damien needs to feel like he's threaded through a lot more of this story. And I'd be like, oh, great. Okay. So that he can go there, he can go there, which means that this one probably needs to be a different character. Uh, and then there was also the, the fact that like, as I was writing it, it became clear certain characters worked with other characters quite well. Um, and like, weirdly, it, it, you know, not, not to get all sort of ooh, writing, uh, but it's like certain characters were like, felt like they were making friends um, through the writing process. I get that. And so then there was like aspects of like, okay, we'll go through back through those chapters and like, you know emphasize that a bit because like these characters want to be want to be friends they want to have more of a connection so you know go back and put that in um so it was very much like you have a blueprint and as you're writing it you are adjusting and uh just hammering all the all the dents out that you didn't notice uh, when you were actually potting it so what you're saying is there isn't a room with about a mile of red thread in it crazy person board someone Liv, I, I i cannot emphasize enough how much i rent in london i do not have a wall to put red <laughs> how long did the writing process how much space taking? do you think i have <laughs> how long did it take from start to finish to, to get them oh god uh it's that's a really difficult question um because uh it was at one point being sort of workshopped and tweaked alongside uh, a different uh, a couple of other uh, book ideas um i would say 13 stories specifically start to was locked in place and i started actually writing it maybe a year and a half ago cool possibly a bit close to two years also, while I remember, um, Needs More Damien is possibly the best editorial note any horror novel could receive. <laughs> could we Damien this up yeah, a little I'm, bit? I'm very, I'm very fond of uh, Damien. Like, I, I always find that I end up like giving different characters just like a specific part of myself, uh, and I'll just be like, okay, well, you will have how I... like how I look at a cityscape you will have and Damien is very much like you have a softness for 70s prog rock <laughs> <laughs> which is just which just endears him to me massively <coughs> I was I was very fond of Damien I was I was very fond of Yannick Yannick's just kind of uh, yeah, oh yeah Yannick uh, shit kind of response is very endearing yeah 
Uh, yeah, yeah, Yannick. Uh, so Sash was was reading it through, uh, and there's a bit where uh, like Yannick sort of uh, effectively talks through his his theory about like fun- how fundamentally all rich people are in many ways like actually very stupid. Uh, and Sash sort of just looked up and was like, "This is what you think, isn't it?" <laughs> I was like, mm, yeah. little, little bit. There's a reason they call it bleeding on the page. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's there's one particular thing I really wanted to talk to you about because it's taken me a little mm. while to figure out what impressed me the most, and it's this: you weaponize ambiguity in this novel in a really interesting way, where an awful lot of horror fiction gives you. The reassuring kind of hand, not claw, wrapped around yours of something weird is happening, and it's okay because you can see it too. And there are two or three instances in this, and I think it's it's actually how Yannick ends up being folded in, where there is something very odd happening, which is very clearly being perceived by one character, and no one else can see it, and you don't describe it, and you or you describe it in the loosest terms possible, and it is profoundly unsettling because it's like you lay out the rules and you go these don't apply and i <coughs> i wanted to give you a chance to talk about that maybe well i think um uh, as as with i mean any conversation i have about horror a lot of it for me comes back to mr james um uh, who was very much my education uh, and remains very much my sort of uh, role model, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, ghost stories and in terms of, of horror. And like the lesson f- to me from M.R. James is that perspective is the absolute most important tool in uh, a horror writer's arsenal. Um, who, not just what is being seen, but who is seeing it because the perspective of the person being haunted and the perspective of the person watching someone being haunted are completely different. Yeah. And the per- the perspective of the person being haunted is not necessarily the scarier of the two. Um, like, I think like one of my favourite M.R. James stories is called A School Story. And it is just four... It's, it's just two people talking about, like, reminiscing over their school days and one of them was like oh there's a slightly weird you know thing that happened in my school and he narrates four events that he was sort of semi-present for he was not involved in the horror story at all it's just these sort of snippets of a horror story clearly happening to someone else and the and like the spaces in between um that allow this perspective and like the, the the weird sort of third hand perspective to actually be in many ways more horrific than yeah. if you knew exactly what was happening and i think um to me the idea of uh, a haunting specifically but a lot of horror stories is an intensely personal thing so it's very important that while while aspects of a haunting can bleed over, I always think it's very important that no one can share your haunting. If somebody is watching you get haunted, they are watching you get haunted. And yeah, maybe they'll see a shadow or maybe they'll like, maybe they will see the haunting, but they won't have a, they won't actually know what they're looking at. It'll just look completely normal to them. And that idea of, um, yeah, you know, the watching someone get haunted is focused on the person rather than the haunting itself, I think is is very important for creating that that space. Yeah, and your your point, your 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 description of it as a third perspective is I think the best possible way to describe it. Because again, going back to, to school stories and this this is one of those moments where I, I'm 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 always a little reluctant to go that the best possible thing we can do with horror is study the past. But the best possible thing we can do with horror in this instance is actually study the past a bit. Um, with school stories, that captures so perfectly that thing which almost everyone I know had growing up, where there are the weird things that happen that you just mm-hmm. kind of shake off and go, yeah, that that was Wednesday. I had geography after it. And it's 
always this the, the way I always think of it is it's the thing that moves through the herd at the watering hole and you don't see it but you see the herd move yeah. to get out of the way it's the lobstrosity at the end of the mist it doesn't see you it can't see you but you can see enough of it to know there is something that you don't want to see all of yeah I love something that. bad has passed by here exactly yeah it's and <coughs> like and in terms of the past i think i think it is a mistake to idolize the past but i th and like especially the past works in in fiction and you know in, in a lot of horror fiction especially yeah. but i think it is I, I think there is still i mean i think there's an awful lot to learn from uh the 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 work like the horror of um uh, the horror of past the horror of the past uh both oh, yeah. in terms of things uh, in terms of learning what to do and you know learning what not to do um and it's also just a fascinating thing because you know the things that fundamentally while a lot of the things uh you know mr james was, was scared of uh still resonate a lot of them don't you know um like horror and what you are scared of is born out of who you are in the society in which you live and the position you occupy within that society um and you know mr james specifically occupied an incredibly comfortable position exactly. um in in a, in a in a in a in a society that was incredibly comfortable for him um so i think i think there's i think it's important to uh, like i think it's important to look back with a critical eye because Definitely. there is a lot you can learn uh but i think unthinking valorization or saying oh the old masters they knew what they were doing uh is unhelpful at best i i've yeah shall we all just laugh and laugh for a moment yeah oh oh howard phillip just fuck off God, he anyway was, he, was, he was a he was a he was a scared fellow wasn't he <sighs> providence rhode he island's number does... one celine dion impersonator Mm. You'll never unsee that now. I'm sorry. Hey, Howard, why the long face? <laughs> oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, he's the the like. I mean, what a decad. <laughs> yeah, that's getting close. <coughs> No, no, you, you can, you can, you can, you can clip me, clip me on that one. Uh, Howard Philip Lovecraft, dickhead. There it is. Happy to be on record with that. <laughs> Likewise. So anyway, after all of that, let's take some questions from the floor. Um, oh yes, yes. First off, we have Alex Jack Ghostling, who I believe did our excellent um, opening fan art this week. The name is very similar. Uh, who wanted to know? What's your go-to writing setup? Laptop, notebook and pen, quill and parchment, cup, cup um, of tea, sick jams, comfy blanket. So, uh, back in precedented times, uh, my go-to writing setup was one of two things. Uh, it was either the uh, notebooks, the, 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 the notepad app uh, in a small window at my day job, uh, that could be very quickly copy pasted into a, into a Google Drive, um, or uh, when I when I had uh, space, it was uh, my uh, tablet and a small USB keyboard uh, that I would set up uh, in a, a coffee shop uh, mm -hmm. or a, you know, usually usually in Nero's actually because I find they tended to have quite nice armchairs a lot of the time. Uh, they generally were given a bit more breadth with uh, you know having nice furniture um, if. You know, you wanted my opinion on British high street coffee chains. Um, <laughs> uh, From the book time. Uh, these days, it's a little bit more... Uh, it's generally like this chair, my laptop, um, later at night than I really should have started writing. Um, I like I like to have... Uh, I like to have a hot beverage... Um, or a you know a dark coke or something like that, but fundamentally I f I have found that being uh, I found that trying to have a specific writing setup has actually been has actually stopped me writing more than it has helped me writing because it gives me reasons to put off actually doing the words, yeah. uh, and I find that generally 
the, the key to me writing is to be in a place with a word processor of some sort and just starting actually typing. Uh, and once I'm once I'm underway, like if I'm a bit chilly, I'll get a blanket or maybe I'll take a, a few minutes to to get a coffee. But uh, it's just that getting getting started. Uh, I, I try to have as few impediments or steps to just starting the words as possible. Music. Yes, no. Music. Any choices? And, and do you have anything on in the background or do you work in silence? Ooh. Um, depends, really. Uh, if I... Music, I tends to be a sign that I'm struggling a bit. Um, Interesting. If I'm, try- if, if I'm working with uh, an idea or on an episode and I'm kind of having difficulty either concentrating or, like, getting a grip on the scary of it... Mm-hmm. Um, I'll generally, I'll, I mean, I'll generally just search like dark ambient playlist uh, on Spotify uh, because I, I like, I know I'll stop hearing it after about five minutes. Yeah, I get that. Uh, and it's just that atmosphere. Um, sometimes, if uh, if I am writing an episode with rain in it, or if I'm writing a, a scene with rain in it, I do like to put some rain on in the background because mm-hmm. I find that puts my mind in the right the right space uh what's what's weird is that like i often find temperature will bleed into my writing quite a lot like if i am if I, if it is high summer and i am very warm you can absolutely bet that i will be writing vivid descriptions of like still stagnant air um and if it's if it's if it's chilly then oh yeah this story's <laughs> definitely getting set uh getting set deep in january um and like the the chill wind is biting as you go out the door um it's it's yeah i love that so so stepping across to our next question this is from specky ferret what was the main Mm. inspiration for 13 um it's it that's it i mean it that feels like a tricky one to answer because the the core seed of it, the actual um, the actual idea for the building itself, uh, was um, given to me, and then we I further workshopped it with uh, Rachel, uh, my a brilliant editor. Um, so in many ways, it was uh, I would say it was engineered rather than inspired. Understood. Uh, but at the same time, it is such a it is a work that is so close to me and how I have interacted both with the city of London and with, and with housing, you know, and with like, it works, it it is very much centered around things that are important to me and that have affected my life to one way or another in, in quite sort of, yeah, like, I mean, quite profound ways, I guess, because like your your home is such a such an important space emotionally. Oh God, yeah. Um, so like, yeah, I, I feel like it's it's not something that was in its essence inspired. Uh, at its core, it was engineered, but every aspect of it that I came to actually write, I very much felt these parts of myself sort of. Yeah, bleeding into. I so guess it's, it's very much the, the the classic creative process. As time goes by, more and more yeah. of you goes in into it. Yeah, I, I I see that, I see that, and you should know that someone in the chat about half an hour ago said when this first came up said, "My God, there is no one on earth better equipped to write that premise than you." <laughs> and I mean, you know, they're not wrong, mate. Let's be honest. Well, I, I've I've never I've never actually lived higher than a second store a second floor. Uh, that's you know I, I've um, but yeah, it did feel like when 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 Rachel was like, "Hey, do you think this is something you can write?" It did feel like well, well of, of course I can. You've you've literally made this for me, uh, which I don't think they actually did, but. Uh, it, it very much felt like that. It basically did. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, next question we have is from RE24601. I love to write myself, but I find it very hard not to lose interest in a long project soon after I start, even if I'm really into it. That said, my question is about consistency. What helps in keeping you focused on a project and getting it to completion? Um, I mean, well, the practical answer is deadlines. Um, because, like, yeah. having that... like, it, It's one... I've, I've, I've said it a few times, like, specifically about the Magnus archives, that, like, I set myself an incredibly grueling rolling schedule because I knew that constant rolling deadlines were one of the few things that could make me work consistently. Um, 30 stories, uh, I had to... I was left much more to my own recognizance uh, in terms of actually uh, getting it written, which had a few hairy moments, but I think by the end I, I did manage to get into a, a good rhythm. But yeah, there was always that external, like, well, it needs to be finished by this date to, to keep me pushing uh, forward. It's a much harder question when you are uh, writing something that is at, that, at, at the current stage just for you. Uh, and that, like, you don't necessarily know if it's going to go anywhere, and you don't necessarily know, and if it is, you don't know when. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to think how the motivation is is hard, and also, like, real talk, the last mo nine months, motivation is a lot harder as well. Well, so, yeah, there uh, is that, you know. <coughs> I, I, I certainly, uh, I certainly wouldn't beat yourself up about it. I also find like I, I, I have a a thing where unless I have an external like pressure, an external deadline, I tend to have like a month where I am obsessed with a thing, and then I will sort of just start to slide off it and and drift away. Um, I think like I've I've found I can beat that with uh, like trying to to build it into a, a proper habit but it's still the, the case that um like i find I, f I find like i need to just pour as much effort into it as i can mm -hmm. during the the window of um the window of fascination um and then i mean and to be fair even with writing something like 13 stories it was very much like well okay i'm i'm in a space where i'm fascinated by this novel right now let's get it all out and then that fascination will fade and it'll become like it'll become a bit more drudge work mm -hmm. um for a, for a few months and then the inf ins uh, the inspiration will will return uh, and weirdly i don't necessarily think that the the stuff that's written when i feel inspired and motivated is necessarily actually better than the stuff that is just sort of like mined out uh mm -hmm. sentence by sentence um yeah like I wish I had a better a better answer than like no, that's really valid, just keep though. going and try to try to ride the waves of interest. Uh, I, I I think I'll be honest. I think one thing that is potentially useful is if you find that you have a specific limited window, start with something that you can complete within that window. That's you know? a really good point. Like. Right, like if 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 you're like, well, I can work on something intensely for a week. Like, write some short stories with it. Like, take a week, write a short story, and sort of see if you can do something. Because completing stuff feel like if you don't complete something, it feels like you're never going to be able to complete something. Mm -hmm. And then when you complete something, you're like, oh, I I did this. And like, I, this 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 is this has also been gradually the arc of. And to be fair, it's it's still kind of my art because like thirty stories because it's of its semi anthology and semi anthology nature. Like there's still a part of me that's like, well, you've never actually like completed a proper a proper novel. novel. Oh, you have that asshole. So maybe in you your can't do it. Well. Yeah, fuck that guy. But do you ever struggle with that <laughs> thing where it's like, okay, but now I've finished a thing and it's gonna be judged now that it's done it's like okay i have to put it out into the world people will comment on it as opposed to if i just put i mean I'm, I'm this forever in the background i mean i i have uh like i i feel that the within me uh there is both the feeling of like oh i don't want to i'm worried about putting this out in the world because everyone's gonna judge it and like 
what if what if it's actually shit and no one's actually told me um and then on the other hand there's the oh great i'm done brilliant off it goes do what you want with it just get it as a, editing edit no i don't want to I've, I've, I've written it once <laughs> Uh, so there's <coughs> there are these two competing urges, uh, and generally the and generally the great I'm done email it off, whew, out it goes, uh, wins out. Tea break. Good. You guys both should have a sip of water if you haven't recently. Our, our chat is unusually good at self care. Do do hydrate. I've I've actually finished my uh, finished my tea, but uh, I might uh, I will I will I will hydrate as soon as I am because also I've kind of imprisoned myself in wires uh you, you can't <laughs> see most of them uh but uh but yeah i'm very much like in a comfortable chair entombed in cables which should be the title of your writing how-to book entombed in cables i like it nice, 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 nice. but no i i'm i'm right there with you on on both those i mean the the, the black archive book that i just finished uh i mm. was felt joyous as i pushed it down the ramp and off to my editor who's going to do the academic bibliography whereas the stuff I sent him was basically just me going, I've read, read stuff here it is <laughs> um, yeah and and likewise um, the novel that's going out to agents next year part of me is just like, no I just need to fix this for the next 10 to 15 years and it'll be fine, it really will and then when it's nice and shiny and we, we're all wearing silver foil underwear and eating fruit pills, then it's time will really have come so th- th- yeah, th- I, I- I've found, like, I, I feel like over the five years of writing the Magnus Archives, the perfectionist bit of me, I've managed to, like, kill pretty dead. <laughs> um, well just because, fast. like, there's a, there's only so, there's only so much, there's only so precious you can be about yeah. an individual episode uh, when, when like, everything's churning at such a, such a schedule. Also, it's, oh, working with, like, the, publishing industry capital p capital i so weird after coming from like sort of indie podcasting where <laughs> everything is like oh can you uh, can you get this uh, written and recorded by tomorrow brilliant and you're like yeah no problem and it's like and then you it's just like well uh, obviously it's going to be a few months uh, before we know one way or the other um uh, and it's like oh we'll need this many words and that's a lot of words it's like yeah but you got a year it's like oh okay it's uh, it's it's a weird it's a weird gear shift. So you you like I have that weird feral thing of I can do this for you now. I don't have to sleep. No, it it it's fine. Take take the six months. Yeah, what? like it just there's yeah there's just the the instincts of like that sort of DIY. Well, no, we'll need we need to fix it now. Uh, of like the 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 indie podcasting space is is yeah. It sticks with you. <laughs> Punk as fuck, but tired is is basically <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> oh, 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 that felt cathartic to say out loud. Um, another <laughs> question. Uh, we have a question from uh, Waterdrop Zero One. Do you have advice for young writers attempting horror? Um, yes. Uh. I would say, like, I mean, do it. Uh, yeah. Like, write it, read a lot of horror. Uh, also, also listen to a lot of horror. Uh, and that's not just me plugging my podcast. I think that horror as a genre is a lot more rhythmical, both in terms of actual language and in terms of structure than um than a lot of uh, other genres um it's it's something i say a lot but I, I feel like horror is a lot is quite close to music in a lot of ways oh absolutely uh, yes. and it's it's uh like yeah dive into the genre uh as as deep as you can like obviously be safe there's a lot of like there's a lot of pretty unpleasant stuff out there but um uh, like Test your limits, learn your limits, dive in and uh, absorb as much as you can. Discard what you don't like, keep what you do. Figure out what scares you. Um, and uh, like, it, it sounds, it sounds weirdly shitty to say, but like, 
don't be in a rush to put your stuff out publicly. Um, I think horror, especially as a genre, is one that is worth taking some time to really practice uh practice learn what you're doing imitate like the the the, the number of uh like as as a as a teenager the number of uh sort of short horror stories uh on my uh like on old laptops that never saw the light of day because like they were straight up like rip offs of like oh I, he, oh he's just he's just read the signalman and now he's he's uh he's writing that or like Oh, he's read his first Clive Barker, and you can <laughs> tell. Um, oh, it's all blood and carpet. And yeah. like, <laughs> um, and so like, I, I think there's there's such a rush and such a, a pressure, I think, in a lot of culture at the moment to like create, create, get it out now, yeah. push out, and it's like, I and I, I think it's, I I don't think it's necessarily the best move for a lot of young creatives to put stuff out if, like yeah, as soon as they possibly can and especially in especially in a in a, a genre like horror which has a lot of which is it, it's it can be very difficult and uh it can it can evoke very strong reactions in people because in many ways you want to evoke strong reactions mm. from people but it, it can be it can be a tricky one to navigate uh, when you're young. So, like, yeah, read, Especially experience, like write, practice, uh, and like, yeah, like, I'd get get some friends, get some friends together in a like, uh, honestly, like, growing up, it it's very important to have your work read, but often like, the public of the like the the entirety of the internet isn't actually who you want to be reading and feeding back on your stories uh like finding friends finding like-minded uh writers and and working with them and practicing and just also find collaborators you know like i don't think any of my stuff i've i've done entirely alone um uh, you know all of my projects have had like magnus has alex uh 13 stories has rachel uh all, like mechanisms had <laughs> about half a dozen um so like i i think you, it's also important to find your collaborators find people you can work with and learn from and and teach each other definitely yeah, Han, you, you had a point i was just gonna say especially and this is more from the publishing side of things or the short fiction publishing side of things especially in mm. an era where anything you ever make available publicly will never go away <laughs> it 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 can be who you to take your time with yeah this, like, i feel i feel truly blessed to have been maybe the last, a member of the last generation who has been able to delete the shitty internet teenage, <laughs> their, their, their shitty internet teenage self, oh. you know? Oh, uh, life, because like, I, 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 you're gonna want to, you know? You, you, you want like, you're going to want to delete everything you have written. Well, I mean, to be fair, it's it's a kind of a rolling thing, I think. That like, I'd say five to seven years after you write something, you'll you'll want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, keep it so that when you are big, people can publish a, a volume of Juvenalia, and then people other and then like Great future word. critics can flick through and be like, oh, he was he was he was garbage. <laughs> so is that your next? What a derivative tea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Wendell's 1967. What was your experience mm. of the editing process and how different was it from the process of polishing your writing for other media? Was the balance of control different? to the edit stages change the story to any great degree? Um, to a degree, I like, I, found, I have always found that uh, like good editing is good editing and bad editing is bad editing almost regardless of the medium and i've been broadly speaking blessed to have like just brilliant editors alex is a brilliant editor and rachel's a brilliant editor um there i think the thing that struck that 
on a story level it was it was very similar like i i think story editing is kind of story editing regardless of what medium you're you're editing mm-hmm. for uh like the there was the 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 meetings i'd had with rachel where we like talk through the different chapters uh, and i'd like pitch my grand story structure and she'd be like oh, well this bit doesn't necessarily quite work felt remarkably similar to the meetings with alex uh where you know i'd be pitching the shape of a season and he'd say well there's a like a four stri- episode stretch here where nothing's really happening what do we want to do with that mm-hmm. uh, i think the biggest difference was uh like copy editing was copy editing rather than nudging like uh generally with with alex uh he'd like he'd tweak he'd tweak um a lot of the dialogue but generally the statements it would be like he'd highlight a bit and be like i think this needs polishing uh whereas like in uh you know with in proper publishing tm um it generally like it came back with like uh sort of marked changes and like this is what i'm going like it would be much more like you'd go back and forth suggesting a sentence in a difficult paragraph. Yeah. Uh, so like you'd send off a draft, it would come back uh, and like uh, a sentence would, would be changed with some reasoning. Like I'd change it a bit more, put my reasoning, um, sent it off and uh, like, and sometimes uh, like in a later, in a later edit, that whole section would be cut uh, because again because you're working on a whole text uh you can have massive story edits after you've had some very like fine line edits and yeah. uh, so it, it's yeah it i think that the main difference was that feeling of like polishing specific things until they shone rather than hammering stuff into uh, a form that that could that could be that could be shipped out yeah i i because uh, yeah it's 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 that time and it's that being able to work it on the whole instead of uh piecemeal cool uh we have a question from compost which uh, which actually kind of speaks to that you've talked in the past mm. about how the magnus archives is very married to podcasting as a medium and is written to lean into the strengths of that medium is 13 stories similarly married to the written word or has, is it perhaps a little more flexible um so 13 stories is uh is chiefly the written word it was written uh with uh the audiobook in mind Mm -hmm. um because uh glance specifically requested and incidentally uh the audiobook is definitely worth getting uh because we've got we've got a full cast for it oh cool uh yeah it's a full cast full cast audiobook each chapter uh, read by a different uh, a different uh, voice actor and the final chapter is uh like done much more sort of dialogue heavy uh i play tobias fell um, and uh yeah and and the 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 cast is really good so like if if you it's one of those things where i'm like if you've enjoyed the book actually do get the audiobook as well because it's it's got some it's it's real good um and, and also to be honest i am a i'm very much a, a a read out loud as i'm writing uh writer um i think it's I, a lot of it i think is just habit from writing for writing words to be read so often but also i i'm i'm i i'm very much a, like i'm not a speed reader i'm i'm very much a like say the words in my head reader uh, and I think that comes out of my writing as well because I I, I will often I will often prioritize rhythm uh, potentially over uh, I mean potentially over sense sometimes uh, so but I do think thirteen stories is uh, I've I've tried to lean much more into the book and into like the written word as format and like there are a few where I, I've tried to play around a bit because I I. I love, I love books like Dracula or Moby Dick or, or like Ulysses, where like, uh, and all of those are. I'm, I'm not actually necessarily recommending you read any of those, <laughs> but uh, I love books that mess with format, that like experiment with different ways to communicate information in this written form, um, and so like I th- I th- I've I've certainly tried to. 
I've certainly tried to to, to engage with uh, engage with the the the, tech, the the form of the text uh, in a way that I did with uh, in a similar way to I did with with Magnus. Cool. That I, uh, yeah, we were wondering whether just to to wrap up whether you'd like to maybe read the prologue. Um, uh, sure. Um, oh, yes. He said, <laughs> "If you can have it to hand, if." Not if having a copy to hand, uh, I can hold on. Let me let me just. Uh... Sorry, what I'm what I'm going to have to do is, I, and I can't, I can't promise this will be the exact prologue that is that is actually in <laughs> the, the, the book. Uh, I can certainly uh, find. A draft of the prologue. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly find a draft of the prologue uh, to to read. Uh, he said, being unable to find a draft of the prologue to read. While, while you are looking uh, for a draft of the prologue to read, one last question: What? What's yes, next? please. What's next? What are you Sorry, on? You, what's next? So what? you, you broke. Oh, uh, what's next uh, is a uh, second book. Uh, Currently, uh, currently hammering out the uh, first draft. I don't know offhand how much I'm allowed to say. It's um, is it a sequel? Uh, it uh, not no. It's it's not a it's not a direct sequel. Uh, though, uh, if you, I the the protagonists. The protagonists of the second book are mentioned, I believe, offhand in a single line uh, of thirteen stories. Oh, um, uh, so it's it's very like it's 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 same world. It's the same world in the sense that it, it is the real world, but a, a bit a bit spooky. Um, the Jonathan Sims literary universe is born. <laughs> yes. It's like the real world, but a uh, little, little bit a little bit spooky. Okay. Uh, yes, I've, I've found a draft uh, of the prologue. Fantastic. Uh, oh, there's a there's a couple of words that are, are redacted, so I'm going to have to just go boop. That's fine. Uh, myself uh, when when reading them. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's thank, been thank an absolute you. joy to talk to you as thank always. Thank you for coming on, dude. This has been great. Excellent. Right. <clears throat> Him. Right. Prologue. Legacy of a butchered billionaire. The life and dismemberment of Tobias Fell. David Erickson. Crime writer. Crime editor. Five years on, it's an all too familiar cliche that the only thing more interesting than the life of Tobias Fell was his death. For most of his eventful career, he was lauded by the public as an entrepreneurial titan. It's no secret he remains the Sunday beeps most interviewed a non-political figure, and we certainly weren't alone in that regard, with his picture gracing the beep business post no less than 14 times since 1992. After his death, this fascination has only increased, though it has now taken on a wholly different character. Even for those who don't follow such things, it's been hard to escape the relentless tide of true crime investigations, conspiracy theories, even discussions on paranormal forums. The brutal slaying has found its way to the top of more than one online list of creepiest unsolved murders. Alive or dead, no one ever seems to tire of talking about Tobias Fell. But there are those that never stopped digging, who never accepted the impossible facts of this baffling case. So is it time those facts were re-examined? His origins were similar to any other billionaire. He was provided with a small fortune by his father and proceeded through luck, skill, and, many say, ruthlessness, to turn it into a large fortune. It has been noted by many that, even by the standards of his peers, young Tobias seemed utterly unconcerned with the ethical implications of his business practices. While many of his more public and well-profiled enterprises, including those covered in this very publication, were PR-friendly tech companies or well-beloved brands, it takes very little digging to notice his most profitable investments came from less cuddly, less cuddly sources. Pharmaceutical companies, gemstone mining, environmentally devastating oil extraction and arms manufacture. 
there were accusations his companies were involved in sweatshops, land seizure, and slave labor, with many progressives coming forward with their condemnations of him even while he was still alive. None of these accusations, however, ever seemed to touch Tobias Fell. A ready wit and an instinct for keeping his distance from the less savory aspect of his business served to keep his image clean, and well-publicized charitable initiatives ensured nobody raised too much interest in his tax dealings, even if many of these philanthropic projects seemed to quietly disappear when the spotlight faded. Every eager would-be tycoon named him their inspiration as he topped rich list after rich list. There were plenty of reports, of course. Human rights organizations condemned his company's ethics, but his books on business advice, reputedly ghostwritten, made for far easier reading. Indeed, looking through the archives of the Sunday boo, it's hard not to see our own complicity in burying many of these stories in the back pages. When Tobias began to retreat from the public eye in the years leading up to his death, this seemed only to cement his reputation. For every concerned activist railing against his businesses, there were a dozen admirers intrigued by this new mystique and the occasional long-lens paparazzi photograph of the now reclusive billionaire. He gradually stepped back from running his companies and his much laundered and his much lauded philanthropy entirely dried up. It seemed the business world's golden boy wished to simply spend his time hiding away in the penthouse suite of Banyan Court, a building he commissioned. It is often said that Banyan Court stood as a monument to everything Tobias Fell was, both to those who held him as their idol and to those who hated him. A towering 13-storey residential development in the heart of Tower Hamlets, one of the poorest areas of central London. The building burst from the old brick shell of a Victorian factory-turned-tenement and blossomed into a grand edifice of glass and steel, a love letter to tasteful opulence. Our own coverage of the construction, Billionaire Makeover for London's Poorest, 3rd July 2007, talked of regeneration and of the project enriching the area, but critics saw only gentrification and the displacement of families, predictions which have largely been proved accurate. One particular point of contention was the part of Banyan Court given over to affordable housing. Local planning guidelines require new residential developments to set aside a portion of their spaces available to low-income occupants, but alleged indifference by the government and enforcement agencies led to persistent rumours about the construction quality of some areas of the building. New residents of these affordable homes reported cut corners, shoddy materials and fire hazards. The flats at the flats at the back were apparently almost completely segregated from the glistening modern facilities of the main building, and within, and within a year, left-wing blogs began to talk about the hidden slum lurking behind the shining facade of Banyan Court, and sat in his pristine penthouse at the top of it all, Tobias Fell. But however fascinating his life may, be, may have been, his death is what most people remember him for. It has gone down as one of the most high-profile unsolved murders in history, the details that were released to the public, and many details that weren't, have been relentlessly dissected by the media and amateur detectives, and almost no aspect of it makes sense. The sheer brutality of the killing was breathtaking, and yet despite the fact that the murder must have taken place inside his penthouse, none of the blood found at the scene belonged to Tobias Fell. In fact, according to certain leaked case files, no positive identification was ever made. The billionaire was listed as the only victim, so why were there multiple reports from people who saw additional body bags being removed by the emergency services? Further igniting the imagination of conspiracy theorists were the matter of the witnesses. Tobias Fell wasn't alone when he was killed. There were 13 other people with him, all of whom claimed to be have been attending a dinner party at his unexpected invitation. Though not all lived in the building, all these guests had some sort of connection to Banyan Court. Aside from a postcode, however, it seems they had nothing whatsoever in common. An avant-garde art dealer, a local plumber, a six-year-old child attending with her mother. Few, if any, of the guests would be those expected at a billionaire's banquet. Even beyond that, each guest said the same thing. They had never met Tobias Fell before that night. They had received an invitation without any sort of warning, and, despite forensic evidence conclusively showing he must have been killed while they were there, 
none of them had any idea when or how their host had been murdered. Despite this seemingly obvious pool of suspects, no arrests were ever made by the Metropolitan Police, and no official explanation of the killing was ever given. In the five years since the crime, none of the police or medical professionals who were part of the initial call on subsequent or subsequent investigation have made any comment on the record. Further fueling speculation of conspiracy were the strange events that occurred in and around Banyan Court in the week leading up to Tobias Fell's murder. The deaths of Edith Kinney and James Andre, each officially labelled a suicide, as well as the disappearance of noted activist Diego Santi, who was last seen entering the building. Theorists have never found a satisfying explanation for any of them. Now, after half a decade, Banyan Court is all but abandoned. As leases end, estate agents have been unable to find replacements, with other residents and landlords abruptly selling or, in some cases, simply disappearing. The once impressive building now stands silent, casting a lonely eye over the dilapidated buildings below. A 13-story tombstone to a man whose shadow still falls as darkly as that of his creation. The murder of Tobias Fell remains unsolved, and it is unlikely it will ever be known what actually happened that night, or what those 13 ill-fated guests truly saw. It's all that good. All yeah. of it. Thank you so much for coming on, buddy. We I really love, appreciate it. No I problem, mate. Really like, it's, it's, really, it's really nice. I absolutely I really enjoy love it. how it, it, you start off with this very news reporter presentation. The boops were very, my personal favorite. <laughs> and then, of course, you get to the end and you just can't help but slow down and chew on the lovely, lovely language. I yeah, well, you that. know, it's, it's, you got you gotta, you got to end with... Uh, you got to end with something cheery. Cool. Uh, to, just before we, we send you on your way with huge thanks, mm. um, we're overdue the curtain call for Mr. Chungus. Uh, Wendy has excelled herself this week. <laughs> Did you explain to Johnny yep. what Chungus is? I have explained to Johnny mm -hmm. that Chungus is our sourdough starter. I have explained It is a cosplaying sourdough starter. It is a cosplaying Which sourdough is... starter. I didn't, get I... The, I, I didn't get the chance to explain that Chungus has a fictional boyfriend. From a Wizard's Guide to okay. Defensive Baking, the Ursula Vernon's that... book we just finished. Um, oh, okay, no, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, you know, that makes sense. Um, Their ship yeah. name is Bungus. But this is Chungus, dressed as Peter Lucas, including in a knives out jumper, which I thought was a particularly amazing. Which is is just my my only. I mean, it's got like split tail coats and buttons and the whole nine yards. I'm just ridiculously impressed. <laughs> Uh, and I, I mean, my only conclusion is Wendy is some kind of crochet sorceress at this point. It's Apparently, it's really the only thing that makes I, sense. This is her like lockdown. I, I do not know what to feel about this other than a sort of <laughs> awed appreciation and, <laughs> and an intimidation. I think, like I, I <laughs> yeah, that's that's astounding. Yeah, we introduced Chungus to to, to their godmother. Um, Ursula Vernon, uh, we've just finished serializing her book called The Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking, which involves a, mm. a feral sourdough starter magical familiar, which is where the inspiration kind of came from. And we've decided that Ursula gets to be the godparent, the deity parent of, of Chungus. So now his moral upbringing is her responsibility. Which, which is, is going to be hilarious. <laughs> That's fantastic. Frankly. I also like, it, it's, oh, it's fascinating seeing it because like, it's fascinating seeing what descript like what images become kind of ingrained in uh, the mind of of the fandom. Because like I'll, I'll be honest, when I was writing Peter Lucas, like Misty Captain Birdseye was not <laughs> like it, it, what, it. Like I mean, I didn't really have a solid image, but uh, but it, Did it's you have it's a very much now. Every perhaps in mind, Johnny. <laughs> I mean, Alistair's certainly been having fun playing around with with. Voices. <laughs> I love that the two of you are both laughing bit. too hard at the concept to actually go through with this. I uh. am going to go. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh. 13 Stories is released uh, no, tomorrow. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Nice try. <clears throat> nice try. Thank you so much for coming on, dude. This has been amazing. No worries. It's been an absolute joy. Uh, um, and... And keep writing things because you write things that are good. <laughs> I I will I will do my best. 
Your, your best is absolutely... Um, oh. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I one, one thing to mention is uh, currently... Um, Currently, 13 Stories uh, is uh, UK is being published uh, only in the UK. I think there will be a US date, but it's probably not going to be for a while. Uh, so um, US uh, viewers who are uh, very keen to, uh, to to get it, there are, um, uh, I'm trying to think offhand, there are quite a lot of uh, UK bookstores that do deliver internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Waterstones and Foils, and Blackwells, uh, also, Goldsboro Books and uh, I think Queens Park, uh, Queens Park Books also yeah, have Park, a few, yeah. uh, a few by me still. Oh. Um, we are seeing yeah. people in the chat who say they have successfully ordered it in the U.S. and are getting yeah. the U.S. release date yeah, like tomorrow. The, yeah, I've I've seen a few a few U.S. folks who pre-ordered it. Um, I think mostly from Waterstones. Uh, it's uh, arrived uh, already, so it is it it is. It, I mean, shipping's shipping's not 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 exactly cheap, but it it is uh, it is it is importable. Uh, so, I, I, pol- and I, I do apologise to any uh, US US fans who, who are looking for a copy because it's you know, out, I know out, it's out of interest. A bit of a headache. Have you been hit by the same thing we have, which is the the, the Obama effect? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, because like this, one of the one of the weird things about like shifting over to um, like yeah, again, like publishing industry TM uh, is that like a lot of stuff uh, that I'm used to like knowing a lot about, or like <laughs> like how, like how it goes out, or like all this sort of stuff. Uh, either it's it, either people are like oh no don't worry we've got a department they're taking care of that you don't need to worry about it and I'm like cool okay or it's or yeah it's it's like uh, things like international rights I I don't actually know um, fundamentally it, it's like they they I am told when there is news you know oh, like uh, we've we've we've, uh, we've recently had uh, signed with I think it's uh, ECMO. Um, a Russian uh, publishing oh, house nice. who are going to be doing a Russian yeah. translation, which is really lovely. Uh, and so, cool. like, when stuff like that, so, like, I I am certain I will be told as and, like, as and when US stuff as, uh, like, when there is stuff to know about the, the US side of things, but in terms of the why or the, the, the aspect of that in terms of, I, I don't really know, I'm afraid. Explain the Obama effect. Really quick, the Obama effect was this this kind of glorious backwash of consequence when Obama handed in a what eight hundred thousand word book? I don't know. Or something ridiculous. His latest book. It, it's massive and it's it's incredibly popular. Like entire container ships of it right, across right, right. the Atlantic, and it it Ooh. also meant that basically every press in Europe was printing this. So when <laughs> uh, there's a lot, it's, it's a big book and there's a lot of it. So the escape pod anthology was yeah. delayed. Your book was delayed. Lots of books were delayed. And now we have this legitimate, thanks Obama. It's which, your fault. Which, which is just like, it's an extra special bonus meme. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really taken with it. We'll just have to, if I think, uh, to I, I don't believe it's so with the U S side, it's not, as far as far as I'm aware, it's not a delay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is that um, so, uh, it, it is. It's to do with how different country publishing houses uh, negotiate and sell with each other. Uh, I, I believe that I believe that the situation is currently it does not have a publisher in the US, okay. um, and so like, which means that Glance will likely pub like if it doesn't get one, it means Glance will probably eventually put it out themselves in the US but it's much it's much better for them and I think for me if it there if it is an actual US publisher it's it's one of these like and uh yeah I don't know publishing, publishing. it's apparently complicated uh. uh which and which as I say that like that that's not being me being snarky that's that's me not understanding and the intricacies of it um but uh the upshot is it will be available in the US at some point. Brilliant. I have no idea when that point will be. Um, one one last thing, and then thank you so much for sticking around much longer than than we we, we asked no, you to. I really appreciate it. Uh, is the audio book arriving tomorrow as well? Do, do you know or not? It is in the UK at least. Uh, yes, the audio book. 
Uh, yeah, the audiobook should be available from uh, UK Audible. I think it's going out on a few other platforms. I, 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 think, I think people have had luck finding it on the Australian Audible as well. Uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the situation is in terms of changing of like you know and obviously I wouldn't I would never advocate lying to Audible about where you are. <laughs> obviously, that's you know oh that'd Remember, be that'd be dreadful. Uh, wrong is bad, but <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, it's but it's it's certainly dropping on uh, UK Audible tomorrow and uh, hopefully uh, a few other platforms. Brilliant. I, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Johnny. This has been amazing. Um, we, we will let you go and wend your, wend your merry way. Folks... Un, un, untangle yourself. Yeah, fr from your cage of ways. Yes, de, uh, de, uh, <laughs> just sort of carve my way uh, out of my... Uh, you just need the Indiana Jones cables. hat and the machete <coughs> now, right? Um, folks, do please stick around. We'll, we'll be back in a few minutes uh, with some shenanigans and other things.